Well, hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Future of Development Finance Summit uh, here at DevX. We're just so delighted to have all of you joining us for such an important discussion. And one of the key themes of this discussion all day has been climate finance and the transition to net zero. And we've got a moment now to talk with the European Investment Bank, the EIB, to better understand what this transition is actually going to look like. How does it actually work at a global level? So much of the news around it is in high income advanced economies. What about low and middle income countries? So I'm, I'm very delighted to be joined by Ambroise Fayot, who's a vice president of the EIB. Ambroise, nice to see you. Nice to see you too. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. So um, maybe you can tell us a little bit about what this transition to a net zero world actually looks like and what is the EIB doing about it? Okay, so the transition to a, to a net zero, uh, to, a net, to a neutral, basically, climate neutral economy is something that, that is a key element of the strategy of the European Investment Bank, and it is also a, a key element of the, the strategy that is in the EU Green Deal of, uh, of the European Commission chaired by uh, Ursula von der Leyen. And basically, the idea is that we need to uh, develop projects, develop products, develop commitments, to make sure that we can reach the uh, climate neutrality in in 2050 in in Europe. Now that is that is for Europe, and it has many implications in terms of the financing we do, the things we are not going to finance anymore, the Paris alignment for projects, the Paris alignment for counterparts that we will announce in uh, in Glasgow, and a new adaptation plan that we'll also announce in in Glasgow. Because part of what we are doing is also to promote uh, the, the, the climate projects outside of Europe because the climate challenges are indeed global. So we're going to see maybe less financing of carbon intensive projects, more financing of sustainable, renewable projects, and then you have this adaptation plan. Maybe we can just talk about renewables for a moment. What, what is your strategy when it comes to thinking of renewable energy in those markets in especially low and middle income countries? Okay, uh, what, what we have decided to do two years ago is to stop financing uh, fossil fuel projects. And what, what we see actually in, in, in terms of renewable energy is that it is becoming cheaper and cheaper to finance this kind of project. And this kind of energy is indeed the cheapest for the new projects that we finance, in particular also in Africa. When you take the scaling solar in Senegal, the cost of solar energy is incredibly cheap. So what we want to do, and we have done 1 billion projects uh, in, in, in renewable energy uh, in, outside of the EU in, in 2020, is to try to develop this uh, and, and to try to help the, the countries that, uh, that are in particular in Africa to have more of these projects with some technical assistance, some capacity building, and there are a lot of initiatives uh, New Africa, Agri, Desire, etc. There are many initiatives, and also this is something where we need to add a component of that that is linked to the grid, uh, because uh, you know, and and also mini green, and also uh, the networks related to to this, so that we can really try to have a big impact in terms of the needs are huge in in in, in poor countries, especially in Africa. And actually, what you see is new technologies can help a lot. Digital can help also a lot. And this is something that is really a key target for the European Investment Bank. Yeah, we've heard about it already today in the conference, you know, solar, for example, rooftop solar. There's a clear economic argument. There's retail demand for it. Yet, how do we scale it quickly, right? So much of this is about scale. And of course, EIB, you bring a lot of scale to the table when you think about, you know, issues that are across many countries that are global in nature. T tell us a bit more about this adaptation plan. What, what is you're announcing it at Glasgow? What is so important about your new approach to adaptation? I mean, let let me look at Africa. Africa is the continent that contributes the least to climate change and that suffers the most from climate change. And actually, the the consequences of climate change you already see them, and you see them for some time already in Africa. It's not only in Africa. Right? It's not only outside of the of the European Union. What you see also more and more in Europe is the consequences of climate change. The flooding that come much more often than before, the, the wildfire that come much more than before, it means that you have to help everywhere in the world to make sure that when you build a project, you have also a resilience part that is included. You have uh, something related, for example, to smart, to smart cities, to, uh, to something that is, that is really helping, including when you are doing that, the elements that uh, that include the what we call the adaptation, which is contrary to mitigation, is not something that has an effect on 
on the, the CO2 emissions, but on the consequences of, uh, of what is already happening. And in Glasgow, we will, uh, we will announce a tripling of the volumes by 2025 that we do an adaptation so that it comes from 5% of our climate action to 15% of our climate action. And that is combined with more technical assistance, with more capacity building to help the promoters of projects, especially outside of the EU, uh, in an initiative that is called ADAPT that we will also announce in Glasgow. And that tripling, what will that turn into in terms of actual you know, annual euro amount or portfolio size? How much are we talking about? I mean, today we are talking about something like uh, 3 billion euros per, uh, per year. So we would uh, do around uh, 4.5 billion euros per year. The thing that I think, I think is important is that it is 5% to 15% in climate action, but in a volume of activity that goes from 25% of what we do to 50%. So the basis also is going to increase, which is going to make the effort even bigger for us in terms of adaptation. And I think it is really, really well welcome because we need that. And will this be hard to do? I mean, are there plenty of adaptation projects just waiting to be financed? Or do you find that you have to build that deal flow, that you're going to have to use technical assistance to generate these opportunities? Both, right? Both. Uh, you, have, you have certainly projects. And actually, what we are going also to propose is that for projects that are clearly mainly adaptation oriented. Normally we don't finance more than 50% for the project because we want that there is a crowding in of other finances. But in, in this case, we can move to 75% of financing of a project and even 100% of a project when it is in least developed countries or, or small islands. And at the same time, there are certainly components of adaptation that you include in, uh, in, in projects that you do on mitigation. Let me give you one example. In Vanuatu, we have financed, you know, there are cyclones there, and there is also wind energy. Uh, what, but we have financed is that there are, uh, there are, there is wind farm. We have, we have financed projects where the wind, the wind, the wind turbines can be retractable. So they can, they can be put down when there is a cyclone coming. And that's adaptation. So you combine both mitigation and adaptation in the same project. And I think this is what probably you are going to see in many projects. So that's a fantastic example. And you're right, for so many people experiencing energy poverty around the world, you know, moving them straight to renewable energy is a mitigation technique, but it's also adaptation in a way. They need access to energy to survive the changing climate. Um, we have the COP is on right now. And of course, you have an audience here at the Future of Development Finance event that you're speaking to of development finance institutions, of impact investors, um, of multilateral development banks. What does this news about your adaptation plan mean for all of them, for this broader community? What do you want to say to that group? I mean, uh, clearly there is, uh, there is more and more uh, announcements that have come on adaptation. Adaptation is one of the key elements that the uh, UK presidency wanted for the, for the COP, wanted for, uh, for, for Glasgow. So uh, there are a lot of uh, things that will be actually uh, announced in Glasgow by colleagues, by many financial institutions, uh, be them public or private. And I think this is well deserved because we need to do more on adaptation and we need to do more commitments, but also more delivery. That is for common for adaptation also in general. We need to, uh, to speed up the pace of investment because we are in the critical decade now. Yeah, I would think that may be the, the best moment to end on because you're absolutely right. This is a question of urgency, right? We have a lot of the models in place. Organizations like yours are building out new financing approaches, but we just need to move at a much faster pace. Exactly, exactly. And you know, we know that uh, it, it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty good that there have been so much, uh, you know, so many new commitments taken to towards uh, 2050, 2060. It's very good. But what we know also when you listen to, to, to experts is that uh, you need to start big now. So my message, my main message for, uh, for, 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 for Glasgow will be, yes, commitments are extremely important, but invest big and invest now. Well, it's fantastic to have you here. I'm Bro uh, Fayol from the EIB. Thank you for your partnership, uh, for helping to support this event today and for your good work on these issues. It's a pleasure to be with you. Thank you so much.